With tensions building between the United States and North Korea, we now take you live to the Congress of the Workers' Party of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, where party chairman and supreme leader Kim Jong-un is speaking. I'll supply the translation. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, uh, without which I would have had all of you put to death. In fact, I noticed my dear friend Kim Jong Kim was the first to stop applauding, so obviously he and his wife and children will be tortured and then shot. Ha ha ha, I always like to start these speeches with a little humor. I come to you today at a time of dangerous crisis uh, to issue blustering threats and overblown braggadocio while you applaud wildly or die your choice. If the United States continues its acts of aggression in an attempt to prevent me from acquiring nuclear weapons, just because I'm completely out of my mind, I will either respond with a show of force greater than anything the world has ever known, or I'll shoot off a rocket that sputters around wildly like a leaking balloon and then falls harmlessly into the sea. I'm not yet sure which. But believe you me, whether I destroy the known universe or blow my own foot off, you will cheer wildly as if I did something wonderful or take a bayonet in the ear. The point I'm trying to make <laughs> is that no matter what happens, you will continue cheering or I will kill you. <laughs> The problem we face today is that America's former president, Barack Obama, is gone. <laughs> the guy is hilarious. So we're no longer dealing with a mincing girly man whom I could slap around and abuse and almost as I would my own mother. Now the Americans have Trump, and I'm here to tell you he is one crazy white man. No, I'm serious. You think I'm nuts. This Trump guy is totally out of control, and if we're not careful, <laughs> he could kill us all. He's just that insane. I mean, look at his hair, for crying out loud. Even his hair is crazy. <laughs> I know that <laughs> some of you think my hair makes me look like one of those woolly woolly toys where children use a magnet to put iron filings on a picture of a bald man and of course I plan to find out which of you think that about me and destroy them painfully but Trump's hair is so crazy it strikes fear into my heart and his hair is still not as completely Looney Tunes as the man himself therefore I tell you today two fat crazy men with nutty hair and nuclear weapons are screaming threats at each other and it's a terrifying situation. So I hereby issue an order to kill everyone everywhere, and then I'm leaving for my country home in China until the smoke clears. That's it. I'm out of here. Start cheering now. And that's the news from North Korea. Run for your life. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky dunky, life is tickety boo. Birds are winging, also singing hunky dunky. Ship shape, hipsy topsy, the world is a bit easing. It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hurrah! All right, we have to set the crack up meter back at zero. I'm sorry. Uh, who knew the destruction of the world could be so hilarious? <laughs> right. So Molly, uh, Molly Hemingway is with us today. Did you see this last night? She was. She was. Did you see this thing on Special Report? She was on Special Report. You know, they have that panel at the end of the show, and it's usually it's usually a very stately, kind of pleasant, collegial panel. And she and Steve Hayes. Well, I'll play it for you later on. I'll play it for you pretty quickly, actually. Uh, she and Steve 
days went off on each other about Trump. It was pretty good. So we're going to have her on and find out whether she wants to move on to fight Mayweather at the, the Garden. <laughs> so, um, what else? Oh, you know, she will come on after the break. So if you're watching on Facebook and YouTube, you will not be able to see her, but you will be able to hear her if you come over to the dailywire.com or you could subscribe. If you subscribe, then you can watch the whole thing right on the dailywire.com. You don't have to be cast off into the exterior darkness where there is great wailing and gnashing of teeth. Also, mailbag tomorrow, right? Tomorrow's yeah. the mailbag, yeah. yeah. So tomorrow's the mailbag. If you subscribe, you can get your questions in now, answers. You can ask about anything. You can ask personal questions, religious questions, political questions. Answers are guaranteed 100% correct and will change your life on occasion for the better. If you subscribe for a year, it's only 100 lousy bucks for the entire year, and you get the leftist tears tumbler. And while I'm talking about it, please go on. Remember we had Michael Knowles on? Remember what a snotty little brat he was? <laughs> if you don't want his show to trend higher than mine on the iTunes rating, please go on and review the show. Give it five stars and say what a great show it is and subscribe so it comes into your uh, device automatically. And that will uh, humiliate Knowles, which is obviously the purpose, I think, of, of life, really, uh, of, altogether. If I seem a little sprightly, it is because I'm getting so much sleep. That's why. I have actually, for two nights in a row, slept for six hours. I mean, this is an incredible. This is like an I think they're putting in a, a, one of those plaques on my house, like uh, on these two nights, Clavin slept. And part of the reason must be because of bowl and branch sheets, which are so incredibly comfortable. They're like those sheets you get in hotels. You know, you get into a hotel and you slide into that bed and you think like, whoa. I mean, if it's a nice hotel, not the kind of hotel you people are going to. But I mean, you know, a <laughs> pleasant hotel, you get those sheets that are just really, really comfortable. They make it so much, so pleasant to be in bed, so much easier to fall asleep. Bowl and branch sheets are crafted from 100% organic uh, cotton, which means they not only feel incredible, they look amazing. And since Bowl and Branch sells exclusively online, you don't pay that expensive retail market. It's half the price for twice the quality. You will love these sheets. Try them for 30 nights. See for yourself. If you're not impressed, you can return them and get a full refund. They don't mind doing that because they know you ain't going to do it. Anyone who sleeps on Bowl and Branch sheets loves them. And that's why they have thousands of five star reviews. The New York Times, Forbes, and the Wall Street Journal all rave about them. And three U.S. presidents have Bowl and Branch sheets. I'm not sure who they are, but they won't tell who they are, but they do. Go to BowlandBranch.com today and you will get 50 bucks off your first set of sheets plus free shipping in the U.S. when you use the promo code CLAVEN. How's that start? <laughs> well, because I've been getting so much sleep, I can tell you it's K-L-A-V-A-N. 50 bucks off plus free U.S. shipping right now at BowlandBranch.com, spelled B-O-L-L -L, and Branch.com. Promo code CLAVEN, BowlandBranch.com promo code Claven. They get softer every time you wash them. It's really, really interesting. So speaking of Kim Jong-un, did anybody notice that he backed down? He was going to bomb Guam and suddenly eh, maybe not so much. <clears throat> so, of course, the press was just rushing out to say, you know what? We here Here is a, a montage of all the uh, reporters saying we were wrong about Trump's aggressive stance. And, you know, we really praise him that he got uh, Kim Jong-un to, to back down. And that's the montage. Nobody talking about it at all, right? I mean, all we heard was when he said, oh, there'll be fire and fury. Oh, it is always starting nuclear war. And then Kim Jong-un was like, mm, maybe not. Also, he did it because, of course, China joined in the vote uh, at the UN to sanction him. And that's Nikki Haley working her magic behind the scenes. And that's, you know, something that, uh, you know, also sh should be praised. And so I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot of a lot of uh, press, I'm sure, will be out there talking about what a wonderful job the president of the United States is doing in keeping us. <laughs> you know it. They will. So let, let, let us look at this Molly Hemingway clip, because it's really, really interesting in light of what's going on. Obviously, the story so far, right, the story so far is that Donald Trump comes out after t first. First, he comes out and makes the statement. Everybody talked about the statement and said he didn't condemn the alt-right. And that's what makes him so evil. But I, let me play the second part of that statement. This is the first statement Trump made uh, that that nobody has talked about at all. This is number nine, cut number nine, I think. Is yes. it cut number nine? Yeah. OK, so he made this statement. This is the first statement he made. And nobody plays this part. Above all else, we must remember this truth. No matter our color, creed, religion, or political party, we are all Americans first. We love our country. 
We love our God. We love our flag. We're proud of our country. We're proud of who we are. So we want to get the situation straightened out in Charlottesville, and we want to study it. And we want to see what we're doing wrong as a country where things like this can happen. My administration is restoring the sacred bonds of loyalty between this nation and its citizens. But our citizens must also restore the bonds of trust and loyalty between one another. We must love each other, respect each other, and cherish our history and our future together. So important. We have to respect each other. Ideally, we have to love each other. So not exactly like code to the alt-right to, to go nuts. I mean, it was a pretty, pretty strong anti-racism, you know, racism, anti-hatred statement, but he didn't call out the white supremacists because in his mind, right, he knows that the anti-Fa guys are just as violent. They're all over the country now pulling down statues. I mean, it's kind of this animalistic vandalism. They're pulling down statues that uh, they feel represent the Confederacy and they're kicking them. It's like this, it really is this animal, you know, it's, it's ugly. It's ugly stuff. They're incredibly violent. As I've said, I have a particular animus toward the Nazi right because they're in my house. I am on the right. I And I reject these guys in every single thing they believe. I reject everything, including their stupid tiki torches and their idiotic, you know, soil and blood, this Nazi crap, you know. I mean, all, all this stuff. I just want to, every time I see them, I just want to take a shower because they're on our side and that's what makes them doubly bad. And I would like it if Trump would come out and say it. So he did come out the next day. He comes out and he said, you know, I, I won't play it again, but he said, I single out the KKK and all these stuff. And of course, here are all the reporters praising him for making that change. Oh, yeah. It's the same, same, mon, same montage as we had for North Korea. So, Molly is on and, and Molly is great. And Steve Hayes is great, by, by the way. This is this is one of the things about about them is that Molly Hemingway, wonderful. She's the editor of The Federalist, a great, great site. Terrific journalist, goes on Fox a lot. I think she's one of their contributors now. And she always has eloquent, uh, insightful things to say. Same thing about Steve Hayes from the Weekly Standard. I know Steve. I know Molly and Steve. They're both really nice people, really talented journalist. Hayes, very bright guy, writes for the Weekly Standard, hates Trump, has hated him. He, he had my favorite line of the campaign where he said, are we going to have to sit around and listen to some orange guy? <laughs> so they went off. And so so Molly is surrounded by all these guys, right? And it's and Krauthammer, of course, who was the king of commentary, and they're all dissing on Trump, and she went off on him. Listen to this. It's like we're living in an alternate reality here. People are taking, they're not listening to what Donald Trump actually said on Saturday, and they're not, they're not reading the actual full comments that he gave, where he was explicitly denouncing bigotry and violence, where he called on people to come together. And the fact is that there actually is a violence problem on both the left and the right. In recent years, Americans have seen violent protests in everywhere from Portland, Berkeley, Ferguson, Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, Brooklyn, Baltimore, all throughout the country, people have experienced these violent protests. There was an assassination attempt against Republicans by a totally mainstream progressive leftist activist. And there is a problem on all sides. And people need to come together to denounce all of those things and not tar the entire Democratic Party as being part of the leftist violence and not tar the entire Republican Party as being part of the rightist violence. Steve, quickly, we're going to... Yeah, look, look I, well, I, I agree with you that some people are living in an alternate reality. I just don't think it's us. The, the problem is, if, if you you look at what the president said he didn't single out those specific groups you, what you read to mo was what he said today the fact that he didn't do it for two days speaks volumes and the fact that he he condemned generic racism and bigotry it's a it's a it's, cop out uh, nothing cowardly. Trump says it will ever be cowardly. enough for certain people and that is something that a lot and of certain Americans people will defend out. everything trump says no matter what so, so we cut that a little short afterwards. They just launched at each other and just fell off the podium. And they're flying <laughs> clothes and shoes flying all over the place. It was, it was absolutely terrible. So we'll have Molly on to talk about that because, I mean, that she was standing there by herself on a uh, on a show with, you know, top-notch uh, 
panelists and, and experts and commentators. And that's a very ferocious defense of, of Donald Trump in this moment when he is obviously under fire by everybody. Which brings us to the real question of the day is, how come I look so great? And I know that's what you're thinking. You're thinking, I can't even concentrate on this show because the guy just looks amazing. And the reason is, is I work out and, you know, I, uh, I drink the blood of virgins. No, I don't really do that. But I, but I do. I work out constantly. I work out a lot. And the whole thing about working out is it requires willpower. And one of the things that is great for willpower is encouragement and that you can get at Beachbody On Demand. Beachbody On Demand is an online fitness streaming service that gives you unlimited access to a wide variety of highly effective world-class workouts. These are personalized to meet your needs. There's ex extensive nutritional content and all of it is proven to help people achieve their health and fitness goals. It's step-by-step -step program guides, workout calendars, comprehensive nutrition plans, and innovative portion control focused cooking show called Fixate and the motivation and support of a growing community. Beach Body On Demand is the total package. And you know, it's, it's great because when you travel, that's when, that's when your discipline tends to shatter. And once it shatters, it's hard to put it back together. So you can take this with you on your phone. And these are big, big workout problems. Uh, P90X, which if you've never tried it, will hurt you, but it, it will get you in great shape. Insanity, 21 day fix. There's over 600 uh, different workouts, over 100 recipe videos, and you can claim a free trial membership. How do you do it? You just text Andrew on your phone to 303030. Text Andrew to 303030 and you'll get full access to the entire platform for free so you can ch check it out. And it really is, it's terrific because it's just all this stuff in one place. So, you know, of course, Trump comes out and he makes the statement and it's never enough. And, you know, I, I want to I be clear about this. I don't, I, I never sit put Donald Trump forward as a model of probity or virtue, okay? He is a, uh, he, he's an offbeat guy to have as president. He, he was tone deaf on this. I wish he had come out right away and said, what I wish he had said is I condemn the violence on both sides, but since some of these alt-right guys support me, I'm gonna go out of my way to kick them down the road. And they say that Steve Bannon, I don't know if this is true, This all this anonymous stuff, I even hate to talk about it, but you know, they say Steve Bannon doesn't wanna alienate these people. He doesn't need these people. He, he, can win elections without these people. And and he, I wish he had said that. He didn't say it. He caught up with it. I'm glad during the campaign he frequently was a little too slow to catch up with this stuff. But, but you know, this utter horror that is going on strikes me as a little ridiculous. The press reaction is like, oh, it's not enough. It's not enough. And here, of course, of course, we had to hear after Trump made the statement, we had to hear from CNN's Jim Acosta, who shouted this at him. <laughs> That's Jim Acosta. All right, here's the real exchange with Acosta. Mr. President, can you explain why you did not condemn those hate groups by name over the weekend? They've been condemned. They have been condemned. And, and why are we not having a press conference today? You said on Friday we had a press conference. We had a press conference. We just had a press conference. Can we ask you some more questions? Then, sir? It doesn't bother me at all, but you know, I like real news, not fake news. Get fake news. Thank you, everybody. It's, I mean, any authority that the press would have to condemn him, they have completely squandered in this sort of nonsense. Afterwards, Acosta issued a, a statement on the exchange. If I get on up and dance for you, scream and shout like a witch voodoo, would you give a little bit? Ah, give a little bit of attention to me. <laughs> it's like, Costa is always on one note. You know, whatever authority the press has had, they have squandered it. They've squandered it on the Russian, phony Russian scandal. Uh, they've squandered it on, uh, you know, now we have information that they sought to es essentially cover up the meeting between Loretta Lynch and uh, and Bill Clinton during the election. They sought to cover that up. They didn't want to cover it. You know, it's it's like they just don't have the authority to, to condemn him with the kind of fire and sword that they want to condemn him with. So... I don't know about you, but I am a losing guy. I am an absent-minded professor type. If I, if my wife didn't take care of me, truly, I would be living in a dumpster. It's like not people. People don't get you know they don't understand this about me right away. But as they get to know me, they see it. And I walk around all day saying, "Where did I leave this? Where did I leave that?" And my wife is always like on the couch, on the sofa, and they, you know, you left it there, you left it here. But but if you don't have my wife and you can't have my wife, you can get Tracker. 
Tracker is this new thing. They they are uh, eight years ago. Tracker changed this whole uh, dynamic when they released their first tracking device. And now they've done it again with a new tracker pixel. This is the thing that you attach to your shoes, your watch, your, you know, whatever, whatever it is you lose, even your cat. I mean, even you can even do it with your cat. And then if you, you lose them, you press a button on your phone and it will make a noise and it will, it's loud. So you'll find it. And this tracker uh, pixel is small enough to fit anywhere. It's the lightest Bluetooth tracking device on the market. And whatever you tend to lose keys, wallets, even your cat, where you can put it on this thing. When a tracker pixel is attached, you use your smartphone and 90 decibel alert will help you find it in seconds. What if you lose your phone, right? Then just press a button on the tracker pixel and your phone rings even if it's on silent. You can lo locate an item even if it's miles away. You know what it's like? It's like Waze. They use that kind of community uh, computing to find your stuff. Tracker's 30-day money-back guarantee means you truly have nothing to lose. So try it out. Go to tracker.com, enter promo code Clavin. <laughs> well, let me press my tracker and see if I can find my dictionary and I'll look it up. It's K-L-A-V-A-N and it will get you 20% off any order that's the tracker that's track r t r a c k r dot com promo code clavin for 20 percent off tracker.com promo code clavin very very useful thing we got to say goodbye right to facebook and youtube come on over to the dailywire.com and you can hear us talk to molly hemingway if you subscribe you can be in the mailbag tomorrow we are the mailbag is tomorrow answers guaranteed correct may change your life will change your life maybe for the better it's 10 lousy bucks a month to subscribe for a hundred bucks you get the whole year subscription and the leftist tears tumblr come on over to the dailywire.com all right let's go let's see if we can find molly have we got her there you are how you doing I'm doing great. It's good to see you. I, I was talking about uh, your run in with Steve Hayes. Uh, <laughs> to, you know, I was saying, uh, Molly, as, as I've said, I introduced you earlier, but I'll repeat that you are the senior editor of the Federalist, an excellent site. You are on uh, Fox News all the time. You're a contributor to Fox News now, right? Yes, yes. I am. and you do you do an excellent, excellent job. I am also very fond of Steve Hayes, and you guys really went at each other. I mean, that that seemed pretty heated. Uh, I hope uh, I hope you weren't like actually hitting each other after the show. <laughs> no, not at all. And and I frequently disagree with my fellow panelists at this moment, but it, but we all can handle it just fine. <laughs> but yeah, we had a genuine disagreement on on what happened this weekend, and I think that the view that. Steve has is shared by almost everybody inside the Beltway and certainly everybody in Manhattan. They all came to this view immediately together in the aftermath of Trump's statement that he needed to be very specific about a certain number of groups that they had identified that needed to be named. And they all agreed that this was the fatal flaw of what he had said. So the fact that he had, that Donald Trump had in the aftermath of the conflict between the racists or the white nationalists and, um, the Antifa people in Charlottesville, which led to the death of a woman who was protesting the white nationalists and the death of the two police that were there in the helicopter. They um, they didn't hear what Donald Trump said about condemning bigotry and violence, or if they did, they just didn't feel like it was sufficient, despite the fact that he said that that uh, Americans need to come together and that, that they should not divide based on color or creed or political ideology or whatnot. You know, one of the things that, of course, just immediately got me when I was watching this argument is this is an argument that goes on behind the scenes here at The Daily Wire all the time. I mean, I sort of feel I, I was very opposed to Trump. I can't remember. Were you opposed to Trump at the beginning as well uh, when he I was kind of? No, I, I actually like right away, I kind of got the why people liked Trump. Uh -huh. Then I, I mean, I didn't personally support him and I was pretty opposed to it. And uh, but I always tried to understand why people were liking him. And I it was difficult for me to get to that point. But I certainly did. That, that's kind of the way I have felt. I mean, I sort of felt once he became president, I was just going to judge him from that moment on. I like a lot of the things he's done. He has been in no way uh, an incompetent. He hasn't been he hasn't uh, played to his most liberal um, 
his, those liberal instincts that really worried me. He hasn't he hasn't violated the Constitution as it seemed to me Obama did on a regular basis. It's been a real improvement. But but every day we have these arguments back here where the the question is. <laughs> It, is he somehow polluting the conservative movement? Is there is there something would, at the end of the argument, Stephen Hayes said, oh, you're going to defend him no matter what he says. And the fear is that we will follow him down. The right will follow him down into some kind of Trumpian pit. Are you worried about that at all? Yeah, no, I, I was thinking it was funny that later on in the show, I was criticizing him for his comments on Venezuela. Yes. And how. People, I just kind of get the feeling that unless you're literally holding, or not literally, unless you're figuratively holding a bloody head of Donald Trump, it's not enough. So <laughs> I criticize Trump all the time for things that, where I disagree with him. I just think that a lot of what people react to against him, particularly those people in the resistance, whether that's the activists, the media, or Never Trump, or whatever it is, I just don't agree with their criticisms. I have a whole different set of criticisms, yeah. and they're usually based on policy, because I never really liked Donald Trump in the 80s or the 90s or the aughts, but I kind of understand that the way he talks is the way he talks. So just don't get so worked up about it. Right. Um, but also, I think that a lot of people in the resistance, again, whether that's media or never Trump or the activists, they want to take this moment to perpetuate a smear that has been that actually is part of the reason why Trump rose, which is this idea that every Republican is evil. And I always take it back to what happened with Mitt Romney, another guy I wasn't particularly fond of. But the media portrayed him as racist, as Hitler-like, as a horrible misogynist. They did. And I think when they did that successfully, something kind of broke in the Republican voter. They realized we can literally support someone like Mitt Romney and it's not enough. So when there are these calls for these ritual denunciations and these calls are only made to the right. You know, when people in my neighborhood shot up, when a guy in my neighborhood shot up the Republican leadership, there were no calls for ritual denunciation of mainstream progressive rhetoric. And that guy was actually, you know, a mainstream progressive. And that is so frustrating to people. They, they want people to come together at this moment and not use things like this as an excuse to further divide people. Well, that is the other side of this. And that's the other thing I wanted to ask you. I mean, the, the one question is, is Trump somehow polluting the conservative movement? But the other side of this is, are guys like Steve, and, and I love Steve and I have so much respect for him. I mean, I think he's a wonderful writer and a really intelligent guy, but, but are they being played a little bit? I mean, are they, uh, is the press using their animosity to sort of get in is to wheedle their way into the conservative movement and and rip us apart a little bit i think these things are kind of related i think there is a larger issue going on here which is that the conservative movement itself is going through a major realignment and that certain people are on the losing side of that or on the they're frustrated with what it means i personally think a big part of donald trump's success was in his view that the way that we had been fighting wars and our manner of getting involved in war was not good. And so there are people in the establishment on both left and right that are pretty comfortable with certain foreign policy ideas that where well, they didn't get the American buy-in that they should have. And I think personally that's because Congress has abdicated its role and they've allowed presidents to just keep fighting wars without making sure that they are, um, that they're the ones authorizing these wars. So there's a foreign policy divide there. There's also definitely an attitudinal separation, which is what I was referencing before. People do not want conservative leadership to just go along to get along or to just offer some kind of mild criticism of the moment, but then be perfectly fine with a continuation of the way things are going. Conservative voters keep voting for Republicans with an expectation of results that they're not getting. Mm -hmm. And that is a frustration with the Republicans and it's a frustration with the conservative movement. And I think the key for conservative thought leaders is to wake up to that and respond and provide some leadership. Um, and and I'm not I don't have a huge point of agreement here in D.C., but that's how I see it. You know, I, I mean, it, it was it was a very riveting moment yesterday, that argument, because it was like you were sitting in a Mount Rushmore of commentary when you're sitting with Krauthammer on one side of you and Steve on the other side of you. And I'm not as familiar with Mo. I didn't I hadn't seen him before, but he was obviously a very bright, articulate guy. You're sitting in this kind of like Mount Rushmore of commentary and you're this one voice uh, speaking up for the president and speaking up against this kind of uh, it's a con game the media runs. And well, and yeah. I 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I think it's also mostly, I think what people don't understand here in D.C. is that the average Republican voter understands when they're doing these games like they did this weekend where they hype up a story and then they make it all about Donald Trump saying that really what's going on is that the Trump voter is being attacked. And that's what I always try and think of. It's really weird that this country elected a guy president and there are no people on TV who represent the people who voted for None. him. It's all, I mean, even... You know, it doesn't matter what network it is. There are very few people who actually understand the Trump voter or what led them to get to that point. And I think that's kind of scandalous that I think that media outlets, whether they're newspapers or radio or TV, they should do a better job of making sure to understand the sentiment that led to this moment and not alienate or marginalize that Trump voter so much. It, it really is amazing. I mean, when you look at it from the entertainment angle, when you look at the uh, comedians on late night television, and there's not a single one of them, not one that will say a kind word about Trump or anything against the left. Uh, it's just like spitting on 40 percent of the country. It's like it really is just telling the middle part of the country that they don't count, that they don't matter, that we're not here to entertain you. Or if we entertain you, we also expect to slap you around. And uh, it, it, it seems to me to lead to more division and uh, anger when you look when you step away the, the question that i wanted to ask you when you're sitting like i said with these you know these are top uh, commentators and you hear the fact that you're a lone voice do you think trump stands a chance against the media do you think that these i know that they are selling oh his latest popularity poll is so low and he's always falling 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 it never seems to really fall but he's always falling and things are always about to go wrong and bannon's always about to get fired no there's always going to be this disaster in the trump white house it doesn't happen is that are we being conned that way too do you think i mean do you think that trump is actually um not doing as anywhere near as badly as they want us to believe well, that's what I do think there is a problem with analysis right now, that the same people who failed to understand what was happening in 2016 or who assured us that there was no way in the world that Donald Trump could be elected are now giving us analysis about what his presidency means. And so there's just something <laughs> missing there where you want people to, you know, and I, I get it because when I realized Donald Trump was going to win the nomination, it kind of broke my heart. I, yeah. I'm, a, I'm someone who's very pro-life and I care about religious liberty. I got the feeling those weren't his big issues. I'm also a free trader. I got the feeling that wasn't a big issue for him. So I was very frustrated by it. But at the same time, I understand why people are fed up with politics as usual, why they did not want to be force fed the same type of candidate, why they truly genuinely want change. It's not just in this country, that's across the world. And if that sentiment is brewing, I think people should think about how to make it a positive thing or how to lead it to a happier place or to a, uh, a better movement. But um, the, the thing is, I think that the media and Trump kind of have a dysfunctional relationship where by being oppositional to each other, it benefits both of them. Mm -hmm. And so he was obviously able to ride anti-media hatred to the presidency, and they're able to ride their anti-Trump sentiment to higher ratings or bigger profits. I think who loses in this battle are the American people and that it's not healthy for civil discourse and it's not good because people aren't learning how to just disagree with each other or have kind of a fun chat where you disagree but you come to understand each other or see the good in another argument or whatnot. We don't have good leaders either politically or in the media to help us navigate those discussions. Uh, Molly, it's really nice talking to you. You're a really refreshing voice. Uh, people should look you up on The Federalist. The Federalist itself is a terrific site, and you do a great job on that panel. Try not to kill Steve. He's a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you'll come back and he's, talk to us again. Thanks. He's great. So, yes, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> really, really interesting. I, I just found that incredible, uh, incredibly uh, insightful into what's going on, and I wish uh, there was more Talk, talk like that. You know what I mean? I wish people would talk like that. Here is a great piece that I want to read <clears throat> from Brett Stevens. And I know a lot of people don't like Brett Stevens. He went so nuts against Trump that he actually had to leave the Wall Street Journal. I'm not sure this is why he did it. I uh, went over to the New York Times. Since going over to the New York Times, he's kind of been a voice that makes them uncomfortable over there. He wrote a terrific column today. Brett Stevens is a very, very smart guy. And uh, I don't always agree with him. I thought he went a little nuts with uh, Trump, and especially when he lumped uh, Trump and Cruz together. Okay, fine. So we disagree. But he wrote a great column. And I just want to read. I'll, I'll try and edit it as I go along. <clears throat> but it's really worth looking at. I, I read the New York Times, a former newspaper, so you don't have to. 
<clears throat> Here he says, he says, regarding last week's events in Charlottesville, Virginia, considering the consider the follow following propositions. James Alex Fields Jr., the young man who on Saturday police say rammed his Dodge Challenger into a crowd in Charlottesville, killing Heather Heyer and injuring 19 others, was not a domestic terrorist. That's one. Proposition two, Fields was a fatherless, troubled individual who likely experienced economic disenfranchisement as a child of Kentucky and was moved to violence for motives about which we can only guess. Proposition three, the marchers who gathered in Charlottesville to protest the removal of a statue of General Robert E. Lee are not necessarily alt-right. After all, the alt-right movement encompasses a diverse spectrum of opinion. Four, white people should feel no sense of responsibility because a tiny handful of so-called white nationalists and supremacists falsely claim to speak in their name. Proposition five, the blame for the events in Charlottesville does not lie with any particular group. Proposition six, President Trump was right on Saturday to avoid stigmatizing any particular group. Okay, says Brett Stevens. Now here's hoping you're revolted by each of the six preceding points, because if you are, then maybe we can at last rethink the policy of euphemism, obfuscation, denial, and semantic yoga that typified the Obama administration's discussion of another form of terrorism. That would be Islamist terrorism. I mean, really, the reaction to one and the reaction to another is so different and so hypocritical. And the fact that they, that um, Trump is being absolutely raked over the coals for this. And, and, and look, I'm not afraid to slap Trump upside the head. You know, it, it was really funny yesterday. I took uh, my opening about the uh, white supremacists, making fun of the white supremacists, and I sent it around and they put it up on the one place I saw they put it up was uh, Instapundit, great site, Instapundit. And the a lot of negative comments, you know, why are you picking on the uh, white supremacists, <laughs> you know, which I love. I'm picking on the white supremacists because they suck. That's why, all right, that's why I'm picking them. And they suck. And as I say, they're in my house. I that's um, They particularly offend me in that regard. But the comment that I got more than anything else was, this doesn't take any courage. This doesn't take any courage to hit at the white supremacists. You should be hitting at the left. That's a really interesting statement. And I got it numerous, numerous times yesterday. And what I'm doing doesn't take any courage. Being a police officer, being a soldier, th those things take courage. I just am blessed with the, the gift of complete indifference to what people think of me. So I can say whatever I want. That is that is uh, the gift that I have. It's not, it's not a question of courage. But if it took courage, it would take more courage to hit at the people on my side because they comprise my audience. They are my audience, right? You alienate your audience. Ben Shapiro, who's tougher on Trump than I am, you know, he risks alienating the people who actually listen to him. The left isn't listening to Ben. You know, Ben is a guy who's going to say what he has to say. I'm a guy who's going to say what he has to say. And the thing is, when you hear somebody that you basically agree with, I get this all the time. I, people say, well, I agreed with you up until you said that, and now I'm not listening to you anymore. But think about that for a minute. That means that I have to kowtow to you. That means that I have to lie to you. That means that I have to sell you what you want in order to keep your attention. Instead, you should be looking for people who are willing to possibly offend their audience. It's harder to offend your own audience. This is The, the left makes this mistake, too. They always say, we're speaking truth to power by attacking Trump. Well, no, you're not, because no power in your life, the power in your life are all liberals. All the people who are going to hire you, all the producers, all the big studio execs, they're all liberals. They will hire you for attacking Trump. They might blacklist you for liking Trump. I mean, Jimmy Fallon had to apologize, you know, and they said, oh, he gave an emotional speech yesterday on, uh, you know, attacking Trump. Well, I'm sure he did, because the last time he was nice to Trump, they crucified him, you know? It, so it's, it's speaking to your own, it's speaking truth to your own people, the people who are powerful in your life that really matters. And if you only want to hear your own opinions echoed back to you, then you're just going to be in that echo chamber. And that's how all those conspiracy things, conspiracy things start. Uh, and all the kind of nonsense where you start to believe stuff that only five years later you find out isn't true. All right.
a new we didn't get our art ready we have a new or another new feature sexual follies is that what we're calling it yeah. sexual follies where basically we attack feminists that's <laughs> no 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 it will cover the whole range of sexual uh, misbehavior in our culture today and then we'll attack feminists that's <laughs> so today so today i want to point out an article in the atlantic journal called why do women bully each other at work and this this is a really interesting by Olga Kazan. Now, you know, I, I don't really have bosses in my life. I'm a contractor. I contract for people. And of course, when people pay you, you owe them a debt of, you know, loyalty and service and you want to give them their money's worth and all that stuff. But it's not quite the same as having a single job where you can be tossed out at any time. But still, I have worked with many women. I'm in the arts. There are a lot of women in the arts. And uh, some of the experiences have been spectacular. The experiences that have been awful have been awful in peculiarly feminine ways let me put it that way you know so that, that that is really interesting the only enemy i ever made in hollywood in all and i've i have quit jobs and i've gotten into big big arguments but the only time i ever made an enemy in hollywood was a woman a very very famous woman i can't tell you who she is because you'll know her but you know when i very mildly in the most polite way told her that i disagreed with what she was doing with the script she went ballistic first of all she didn't do it to my face she went ballistic and she called my agent and screamed at me and yelled at me and really did a lot uh, to torment and screamed about me and yelled about me and did a lot to torment me so i have run into these people but this article is called Why Do Women Bully Each Other at Work? And I'm going to change the word. The word he used is the, obviously the B word, but just to be safe here, I'll call it the witches. The witches, they say there are a lot of witches in business. And the witches, as one woman put it, they come in three varieties. She categorized them on her personal blog in a post titled Beware the Female Big Law Partner. So this was a lawyer working in a big law firm. She said the first was the aggressive witch, a certain kind of high ranking woman at the firm where she worked who didn't think twice about about verbally assaulting anyone when one such partner's name appeared on caller ID Shannon told me we would just freak out just to see her calling next was the two-faced passive aggressive witch whose subtle semi rude emails hinted that you really shouldn't leave before 630 she was arguably worse than the aggressive witch because you might never know where you stand last but not least the tuned out indifferent witch she wrote is so busy both with work and family that they don't have time for anything this partner is not trying to be mean but hey, they have things to do till midnight, so you will too. They're going to make you work till midnight. And she, this woman finally said she left the firm and she went to a place with gentler hours. She later took time off to be with her young children. She now says that if she were returned to a big firm, she'd be wary of working for a woman. And in polls, men and women say this too. Men say it less. Men are more willing to work for women than women are. But the writer says, the female writer on this Atlantic Post says, her screed against the female partner surprised me since people don't usually rail against historically marginalized groups on the record. Now, I would take issue that women in America have been historically marginalized, but let's say they are. All right. When I reached out to other women to ask whether they'd had similar experiences, some were appalled by the question as though I were Phyllis Schlafly calling from beyond the grave. Heaven forfend, you should be Phyllis Schlafly. But then they would say things like, well, there was this one time and tales of female sabotage would spill forth. As I went about my dozens of interviews, I began to feel like a priest to whom women were confessing their sins against feminism. And that is actually the point that I actually wanted to get to because I, I know that women I know that women don't like working for women and I know that men prefer working for men though by smaller numbers I, I would say in my life the best bosses I've had have been men uh, but you know I, I can't tell none of us works for so many people that we really have a good uh, selection and as I say the the women who have been really bad and I have worked for some really bad women have all been peculiarly bad and peculiarly feminist ways but what I want to know is how is it that feminism has been allowed to co-op the dreams and desires and opinions of women? This is what I want to know. Why does it take a priest for you to confess your sins against feminism? I have heard this, if I, if I have heard this once, I have heard it 10 times of a woman in private conversation will say to me, you know, I actually, my daydream, my daydream is that a man will come along and rescue me, but I know you're not supposed to dream that. How did feminism acquire the power 
over your daydreams? How did it acquire the power over your opinions and your desires? I would really like to know this. I mean, women are more social than men. Like I said, I'm kind of a guy who doesn't care what people think of me unless I love them, unless I really care about them. If I care what my friends think about me, I care what my wife thinks about me. I just don't care what like some guy who comments, you know, I'm, I have a very thick skin when it comes to what people are saying about me and all this stuff. And I know women are more social than that. They care a lot more. But how is it that women have allowed feminism to co-opt their daydreams and their desires and their opinions? I, I just want to know. I would love to hear from women about this. Like, do they feel afraid to sit down and ask themselves not what they're supposed to want out of life, but what they actually want out of life? Do they ever hold their life up to their real daydreams, the daydreams that they have when they're lying in bed before they fall asleep, when they're walking, when nobody's around? Do they ever hold their life up to that instead of the daydreams they were sold by their feminist professors, their feminist teachers, maybe their feminist parents? I really would like to know about that because I hear this from women again and again. I'm not supposed to say this, but I'm not supposed to say this, but and that was the thing that caught me in this article was not so much about whether women make bad bosses or not, but that nobody's willing, that women weren't willing to say it. They weren't willing to say it. Feminism has shut down women's minds. All right. Tomorrow is the mailbag. <clears throat> Subscribe. Get your questions in. Come on. Look, do you want your life to continue the way it is? Of course not. <laughs> I mean, it's simple. So get your questions in. We will answer them all tomorrow. I'm Andrew Clavin. This is The Andrew Clavin Show.